Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the annual John H. Carlson Lecture, A Tale of Ice, Warm Water, and the Future, with Dr. Fiamma Sterneo. This New England Aquarium Lecture Series event is presented in partnership with the Lorenz Center of the Department of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences at MIT. Tonight's event is also made possible with generous support from the Lowell Institute which allows the aquarium to offer its lecture series free of charge. I'm Sarah Ryder, Director of Ocean Policy at the New England Aquarium, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Aquarium's Simons Theater. It's also a pleasure to welcome our virtual viewers to tonight's program. The aquarium is a nonprofit conservation organization that has protected and cared for our ocean and marine animals for more than 50 years. As we all know, a habitable planet needs a healthy ocean. At the aquarium, we aim to inspire everyone to form a deeper connection to the ocean and to take action to protect it. Our building is one way we do that. Our exhibits and educational experiences promote discovery and instill a sense of wonder about ocean animals and habitats. Another way we protect the ocean is through scientific research we conduct in our Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life the aquarium's dedicated research arm. That research guides the responsible use of the ocean, provides solutions to ocean challenges, and influences policies that create measurable change. We also work to help create engaged, resilient communities in Boston and beyond. Tonight's speaker, Dr. Fiamma Straneo, shares our passion for the ocean. She has dedicated her career to the study of climate in the polar regions and how changes there impact the Earth's lower latitudes. Here to tell us more about Dr. Straneo is Dr. Raffaele Ferrari, Cecil and Ida Green Professor of Oceanography and co-director of the Lorenz Center at MIT's Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences Department. So welcome, everybody, can I move this up? So welcome to the 2023 Carlson Lecture, um, both to the people here present in the auditorium and the people on the web. Um, first of all, I would like to thank John Carlson, thanks to whose generosity we can have this event and who has helped start this Carlson Lecture series, and to the New England Aquarium to host us. Um, before I introduce today's speakers, I just want to review a bit how the Carlson Lectures came about. The Carlson Lecture series is, uh, spon or is, is organized by the Lorenz Center. The Lorenz Center was funded a bit more than a, a decade ago by two professors at MIT, um, Professor Kerry Emanuel and Professor um, Dan Rothman who's still here. Professor Emanuel since retired, so I'm stepping in as co-director. And the Lorenz Center was funded with the idea of, uh, as a think tank, to promote uh, interaction between talented scientists interested in understanding the fundamentals of climate science, and very appropriately was named after Ed Lorenz, the father of chaos theory, also a former uh, professor at MIT whose work was heavily influential in our understanding of both weather and climate systems. In that sense, uh, the Carlson Lecture really fits in this vision because we invite outstanding scientists that have new exciting results about our understanding of the climate system. And the speaker of tonight is no exception. The professor Fiamma Straneo, at least I'm Italian so I can pronounce the name properly. <laughs> All the rest, you'll have to live with the accent, but the names will be very well pronounced. <laughs> um, she uh, started her career in Italy, studying physics uh, as an undergraduate, and then moved to the United States, to the University of Washington for her PhD, where she mostly did work with pencil and paper and some computers at the time. Uh, but upon completing her PhD, she moved to the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in Cape Cod, just pretty close to us. And she started realizing that her interest was in high-latitude climate, and we 
definitely lacked fundamental understanding of the process, but even more importantly, data to support our theories and to inform our theories. So she has become progressively more involved on the observational side of uh, oceanography and climate science as well. And in the last five years, she then moved to the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, the other prominent oceanographic institution in the US in San Diego. But to come to Professor Straneo's work, her most influential contribution have been in documenting and understanding the processes that have accelerated the ice loss from the Greenland ice sheet. We now know that just over the last two decades, the ice loss has quadrupled. And what Professor Straneo realized is that our climate projections completely missed this accelerated ice loss. So clearly we were not understanding something quite fundamental about the physics of interaction of the ocean and ice shelves at high latitudes. So she took a, uh, it on herself to be involved also in the collection of real data to try to understand what parts of the physics we are not understanding. She has since, I guess, participated in more than 15 field campaigns. And I like to think of Yama as uh, the Indiana Jones of oceanography, because you'll probably see tonight that some of the field campaigns that she leads really come pretty close to ice shelves and collapsing ice shelves and breaking pieces of ice that falls next to their pretty limited observational uh, facilities and rafts. Um, it shouldn't come as a surprise that because of all this influential work, Professor Straneo has many accolades. I won't list them all in the interest of time, but just to mention a couple. She was awarded um, the Sverdrup Award by the American Geophysical Union and an honorary PhD degree by the University of Bergen. But at this point, it's time to pass the baton to Professor Straneo, and I'm sure this will be a very exciting, interesting, and stimulating lectures. And Fiamma, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Raffaele, Italian pronunciation, and uh, um, thanks to uh, the Lorenz Center for uh, inviting me here and all the faculty at MIT and students and postdocs uh, I've enjoyed interacting with over the last few days. Uh, thanks to John Carlson and, and the New England Aquarium for hosting this. It's uh, fun to give a public lecture, although it'll be more fun when I'm done. But um, anyway, thanks to all of you for coming here. It's, it's great to see you. So I'm going to start uh, by talking about the Greenland ice sheet. And um, so the Greenland ice sheet, for, for those who aren't, don't care too much or don't know too much about ice sheets, we can think of it as a blanket of ice sitting over the island of Greenland, and it's, it's shown here. And so when you think of it as the bank of the ice, um, it's a bit misleading because the ice is moving, as we'll see in a minute. But just to throw out some numbers, I, I always uh, try and put numbers in context. Greenland and Antarctica hold a lot of fresh water on, on the planet. Um, if Greenland melted, it contains enough fresh water to raise sea level by 21 feet globally. This isn't going to happen anytime soon, definitely not tonight, uh, but it's good to put it in, in perspective. So um, again, to think of Greenland as an ice sheet is a bit misleading because the ice is slowly moving. And this is an animation from satellite data from NASA that shows um, these rivers of ice, so, so the blues are the faster and the reds are the even or magenta, even faster. And what you're seeing are ice streams, effectively rivers of ice, that are moving ice from the center of the ice sheet uh, to its margins. And this is what we call the marine terminating uh, glacier. So a glacier that ends in the ocean where it discharges icebergs, in, including uh, the one that sank the Titanic, and uh, they distribute it all around Greenland. Greenland has about 200 marine terminating glaciers, and so you can see these fingers of ice. And if an ice sheet is stable, we like to use these words, it's basically saying that what precipitates in the winter, um, it's roughly balanced by the discharge in the summer. And there are two ways in which the ice sheet can discharge. One is icebergs at this, its edge, 
through these glaciers. And the other one is just surface melt. Um, you, you melt some of the precipitation at the surface, it goes into the ocean. Um, in a warming climate, we do not expect ice sheets to be stable. And indeed, both Greenland and Antarctica have been uh, losing ice over uh, the last 50 uh, or so years. But in particular, Greenland has really sped up. Uh, the ice loss really picked up 20 years ago. Um, and, and as Raf mentioned, it's uh, accelerating in time. And so we, we can now measure it. We have uh, good satellites with which we can measure the volume and the mass change. And Greenland has lost roughly 5,000 gigatons uh, over the last 20 years, which means nothing uh, to most people. A gigaton is a cubic kilometer, but it's something like 1,200 cubic miles. And um, basically, it's the volume of something like Lake Michigan that you're discharging into the ocean. And this is already contributed to a sea level rise of 13.4 millimeters. Again, it doesn't sound like a lot if you distribute it uh, over the entire planet. That's a considerable amount. And Greenland is losing ice because two things are happening. One is very intuitive. If we increase air temperatures, maybe you've heard of polar amplification, um, ice will melt more. It'll accelerate the surface melt. The second one is less intuitive. It's the speed up. I just showed you uh, that the movie with the ice moving. If you speed up the, sp the glaciers, they'll discharge more ice. And this will bring the ice sheet um, down. It, it will effectively be an ice loss. So um, we care about sea level rise uh, for a number of reasons. One of them is flooding. This, this is an image from uh, your backyard, so, so maybe you'll recognize it. Um, a lot of the floods are associated with storms, but they're exacerbated by sea level rise. As you rise sea level, um, you're going to get more flooding and, and more saltwater intrusions um, in rivers and estuaries, all kinds, in groundwater, it's a lot of complications. And there are hundreds of millions of people living within one meter of sea level rise. Um, so where was I 20 years ago? Well, picture on the top left, I was in Sunny Woods Hall, just down the road from here, Cape Cod, enjoying being an oceanographer in mostly ice-free waters. Uh, but I had some colleagues at the University of Maine in Orno, uh, which is a bit more snowy, so I picked the snow picture top right. And um, so I went there and um, I was talking about Arctic freshwater, changing Arctic. And at the end of my talk, I, these two glaciologists came up, uh, Gordon Hamilton and, and Lee Stearns, and they said, hey, you know, you're you're make, making measurements in the ocean. Um, we're studying these glaciers and, and they're changing uh, quickly. Um, would you like, you know, are you interested? We think the ocean has something to do with it. Would you be interested in uh, coming with us to Greenland? And so I, I was curious. I was like, oh, okay, let's think about it. And uh, just to show difference, oceanographers uh, work on boats, ocean, glaciologists tromps around on ice like they're doing in the bottom right corner. So what these glaciologists were studying um, in particular was a glacier called Helheim Glacier. This is shown here from a satellite image. The glacier is the darker gray thing. You can see all the crevasses. And, and it's moving from the left to the right. Um, and it's discharging into a fjord. And we'll see the fjord in a minute. But what looks like ice, but it's actually ocean, is the white uh, area to the right of the glacier. And so that line in the middle is what we call the terminus, the edge of the glacier. And so they'd been studying Helheim. Helheim is a large glacier in Greenland. I said Greenland has about 200 glaciers, but there's maybe 10 or 20 really big ones and a lot of small ones. And um, Helheim discharges, again, I'm going to throw a number at you, 30 gigatons of ice on average a year. That's meaningless. If we took all that ice and spread it over Massachusetts, you'd get three and a half feet of ice covering the state. Um, 
And it moves fast for a glacier. Uh, you could probably outpace it. Faster a glacier is about three and a half miles per year. Um, and, but in just a few years, um, Helheim had sped up, double its speed. That's a big change for a glacier. It had retreated some five kilometers, a few miles, and it had thinned considerably. And the net result of this was discharging more ice into the ocean. Uh, so we're up to maybe four feet if we put it over all of Massachusetts. So something like a 17, 20% increase. And this wasn't happening to glaciers, just to Helheim. It was happening to glaciers all around Greenland. And um, it meant that Greenland was now upping its contribution to sea level rise. And, and it's now um, accounting for about one fifth of global sea level rise. So, um, Cervelic, uh, Helheim discharges into a fjord. The fjord is a effectively a narrow valley, deep, filled with water. Um, they're associated with um, glacial landscapes, and there's multiple glaciers actually flowing into Cermelik. And, and so uh, Gordon and Lee started showing me pictures, and I was an assistant scientist at the Woodsall Oceanographic Institution at the time. I was just getting my feet wet, or more likely t trying to stay dry in the boats. But um, with measurements, I only had, I only owned um, a couple of instruments. I took a look at their picture, and I said, this looks really cool. But it looks also like you know we'd lose everything I own in two seconds, and so um, I was very reluctant. But then we started thinking, well, what could have caused the speed up of glaciers? And what I'm showing on the right is a schematic of currents um, in the North Atlantic. So there's a big red arrow. You're familiar with the Gulf Stream. The Gulf Stream brings warm water from the tropics poleward, and then there's a whole system of currents, uh, the red ones that carry this water um, into and around Greenland and up into the Arctic Ocean. And we knew these currents had been warming. We knew there was more of this water coming from the tropics. But what I had studied in the textbooks is these waters were kept far from Greenland because there's another current, the blue arrow flowing around down the east coast of Greenland. And these are water coming, waters coming from the Arctic, uh, so blue cold, fresh water, uh, insulating Greenland from the effects of red, warm, subtropical water. The glaciologists were very convincing, and I said, OK, whatever, let's go. And so it's July 2008, and we land in the small town of Tesilek in southeast Greenland. It's the largest um, village in East Greenland. Um, it's covered in snow and ice in the winter, and, and then it opens up in the summer. And everything I had done until then uh, in terms of field work was off of a big research vessel. And, and so you apply for grants years in advance, and you say, I want to go study the Atlantic Ocean. If you're lucky, you get funded, head out, big ship, big instruments, and so on. And here, we didn't really have any funding. Um, we had scraped some money together. And uh, we also, it was the first time I was landing for, in a place for some field work without knowing what vessel it was we'd be using. Eventually we found a vessel. It's not a huge one, but, um, and you can see, you know, we're looking at it, we're a bit puzzled. I'm the only one wearing foul weather gear, smart oceanographer, glaciologist, uh, didn't know what they were getting into. But we turned uh, this vessel into a small uh, research boat. And so you can see there's a fishing reel. Uh, we were collecting profiles all the way down about 900 or so meters. It's, it's a deep fjord, so we're trying to measure the temperature, the salinity. Um, another instrument was measuring uh, the velocity, and, and we also left some instruments behind. And really what made this possible was that the captain of the boat, Akilu Jorgensen, uh, had grown up in this region. There were no charts. Um, I didn't know what the bathymetry was going in. 
we didn't know anything about this region. And without somebody who not only knew uh, the fjord inside out, because like many Greenlanders, uh, he hunts and fishes in the fjord, but he could also read uh, the weather. He could see icebergs minutes before we could spot them in the sometimes foggy uh, weather. And it's safe to say we wouldn't have been able to make these measurements without him. So it was a small boat. Uh, we got about two thirds of the way up the fjord, and, and you know we're dipping an instrument to the bottom of the fjord. And what we found really surprised us. And um, in the picture, what I'm showing is we can collect, we can plot sections. It's temperature. It's in Celsius. Um, but the red indicates really warm water if your ice about uh, four degrees. Uh, Celsius. And so it was the first time we realized that those waters from the Gulf Stream coming from the tropics were actually making their way into the fjords. And above them you have the cold fresh water. But you'll see that we didn't get very far. We were still missing uh, about a third of the fjord. We didn't quite know um, what was happening near the glacier. And what we had shown, though, was this connection. And so I've showed you a schematic. What we'd shown is that these warm waters could cross under the cold, fresh Arctic waters and make their way into the fjords. And this is very important in climate. You know, we have models, but the models, as I'll talk about, they only contain the information that we uh, put in them. Here, we didn't have the bathymetry. We didn't know anything. We definitely didn't know that waters from the subtropics uh, were flowing close to the margins of the Greenland ice sheet. Um, but we hadn't gotten very far, and it was clear that with a small boat, fiberglass, we wouldn't have been able to get very far. Um, we were lucky enough the following year to hitch a ride literally on a Greenpeace ship. So Greenpeace was interested in raising awareness on Arctic change, and we were very interested in having a bigger vessel that could go into the fjord. We still didn't really have any funding. So what was great about the Greenpeace ship is, well, first of all, Greenpeace captains, they're not afraid of anything. So we sailed right into the ice. And um, we they also had, a, maybe you saw the deck, they also had a helicopter. And um, what we can do with a helicopter is we can fly to the edge of the glacier. And remember I showed that Patch. You want me to take the cap off? Yeah. Okay. Of water that's covered in ice, but there are some open regions. And so we began deploying. The boat is at 400 meters, still going. Oh. Okay. Expendable probes and some other instruments so that we could actually measure things closer to the glacier. Um, you can see that we're very tiny, there's very few patches of open water, but that got us a lot closer to the glacier. And we were really looking for indications that the warm waters we had seen were actually driving, melting. So now we can fill in a little bit more, and you can see that the waters, even much closer to the glacier, are still warm. And, um, you know, new map with a lot more dots, and so we're happier. One of the things we found in, in looking at these waters was not just an indication that they were driving melting, um, but we also found that something that we couldn't explain at first, there was, there was a large amount of fresh water uh, that we saw near the glacier at depth. Now, the ocean is salty, it's really hard to get fresh water deep down, and um, what we understood at the time is that this was surface melt. So I mentioned that air temperature over Greenland has been increasing. There's more surface melt. If you fly over the ice sheet in the summer, you'll see a lot of blue, like the pictures I'm showing. Uh, ice will develop channels that develop into a sophisticated system of, um, imagine, pipes that take it to the ice, through the ice. And it was discharging this water at the base of the glacier. Um, why do we care about it? Well, um, if you think of putting an ice cube in, in a glass in your drink and you just let it sit there, it will melt, but it will melt really slowly. But if you take an ice cube and you put it in a glass of water and or whiskey, whatever it is, uh, and you stir it, it will melt really 
quickly. And what you're doing is you're essentially providing energy that drives mixing across uh, between uh, the water and the ice, right? You're allowing the heat that's in your glass whiskey to go to the ice. And so um, what this meltwater was doing is effectively that. So you take a lot of fresh water, you put it at the bottom of the glacier, it comes out at the base of the glacier, maybe 1800 feet uh, below sea level. It's fresh, it's very light, it wants to rise. And it creates something like a smoke stack, we call it a plume of rising light water that mixes and drives a lot of mixing and health and hence melting. And so I'm going to show all the videos I show are from our field work. Some of them are amateur, some of them are from more professional people who, who come with us periodically, but they're all from the field. So um, now we're going to see what these plumes look like, and, and you should get an idea of why I say they increase. So now you have this bubbling water coming up at the edge of the glacier. It's coming all the way down. It's driving a lot more melting. And this is important. Think again, we're trying to understand how the climate system works. What this means is that I can warm the ocean and it will melt the edge of the ice more, but I can also warm the air. This fresh water will make its way to the base of the glacier. Just by mixing more, it will drive more melting. And so this is how we unravel the climate system bit by bit and and we're learning so we can put it in models we're learning we uh even just to increase understanding uh for people like me that's really exciting as it is but we're also trying to improve understanding so we can uh, make better projections of a changing climate impact hopefully of uh, uh, influence policy so let's see where we are i showed you that we we found that warm waters crawl uh, at, under this ice at the edge of the glacier. They're driving melting. We're also seeing plumes of meltwater in the summer, enhancing melting even more. And so these are really um, incremental understanding. And this wasn't happening just at this one glacier. Uh, we had different campaigns. Other colleagues from many institutions are studying this in other places. And, and it confirmed that this was happening all around Greenland. Um, I want to say that I'm standing here and, and I'm showing you this, but really this is the result of a lot of work done by many people. Some of them are here tonight, um, including Akalu, the captain, scientists, technicians, engineers who contributed. And this is just a small team that was working um, at Helheim at the beginning. This is really collaborative work. I would not be able to do it uh, by myself. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to improve sea level rise projections. This is a plot showing sea level rise. Uh, if you go back in time, it's from measurements, uh, in some cases proxies. If you go forward in time, you can see there's a blue curve where I've put less fossil fuel, a red curve where I've put more fossil fuel. We make climate projections in using Earth system models, uh, climate models. We have to specify uh, essentially how much the greenhouse gases uh, will increase. And so there's more optimistic and less optimistic scenarios. And sea level rise from these models, this came out in a report in 2013, do not include the process of ice speeding up. 
we didn't think it was so important. Uh, the science wasn't caught up yet. It just wasn't there. And so what we're trying to do is understand what is driving it so that the people who model ice sheets and ocean, we can sort of plug these uh, two together. Since those years, I've returned to Sermelik many times, uh, much to the disappointment of my kids who keep asking why I don't go to the tropics uh, like all other oceanographers they know. Um, different vessels, we depend on funding, uh, federal funding, philanthropic funding, and so on. Some good years, I get a good vessel. On bad years, I'm stuck with even smaller boats uh, than we had. So I, we make measurements. We have learned a lot of about how fjords work by returning year after year. And I, I want to show you a video because um, I showed you the helicopter measurements, but most of our measurements are based on boat. The ocean is largely impermeable to light. We don't have very many ways of measuring things in the ocean without actually going out and leaving an instrument or putting an instrument in, taking it out, and then reading it. So it requires either an autonomous vehicle or autonomous um, series of platform or it's somebody going out with a ship and putting something out. And so I'm going to show you what some of our missions uh, look like, because uh, I'd like you to get a feel for what climate research uh, it looks like in the polar region. So I, but I want to introduce some of the instruments we're using. Um, this we call it the rosette. It's um, effectively a frame. There's some instruments um, mounted at the bottom, we'll measure temperature, salinity, we can measure velocity of the water. You see these gray cylinders, this is how we collect water samples. So we can program it, send it down, and then it will trap waters at the depth that we would like it to trap water, so we can bring the water back for analysis. Uh, really important in the fjords is our mooring. So we go there in the summer, it's a special time in the fjords, and then we leave. Summer is the only time we can access many of these places by boat or even by helicopter. Um, it's a small part of the year. And so to make continuous measurements, we deploy, <coughs> deploy more than instrumentation in the fjords. So on the right, you're seeing a small anchor and, and a string of instruments. Um, we put those in, there's floats. After a year or two, we come back. And if we're lucky, when we put in acoustic, let's say, communicating device in the water, we can tell one of the devices on the mooring, let go of your anchor and come up to the surface. And if you're lucky, it comes back, often a bit covered in seaweed. But this is how we obtain measurements when we're not there. We can use autonomous platforms. Here it's, are some of the ones we've used to make measurements right next to the ice. You don't want to um, endanger people by going too close to ice. Even if it's an iceberg, uh, pieces will fall off. But we're really interested in the boundary layer processes and what happens close to the ice. So uh, top right, it's, it's a very small ROV, remotely operated vehicle. You can drive that up against the ice. The other one, the green one, is called the Jet Yak. Um, it was built to take fishermen out to fish in big lakes. You take the fishermen out, you put sensors in, and then you can drive it remotely uh, right up against the ice. Um, okay, so um, a lot of the postdocs and, and uh, students that I work with uh, put, help me put together videos or actually put together videos. So they also pick the music, so any complaints can go to them. But um, all right, let's, let's go.
so um, some of it glamorous, a lot of it hard work, although the students seem to always be smiling even when we scrub seaweed off of instruments that have been sitting in the ocean for uh, a couple of years. Um, but again, you get an idea of this is how uh, we learn about the climate system. A lot of commitment, a lot of planning, uh, a lot of um, logging, you saw that. So this is an example of what we mean by a climate record. We desperately need long-term records to understand what is happening. I cannot just go once and learn and say, well, it's always going to be like this. As we try and plug the ocean to the ice sheets together, it's important to understand what drives changes in the water that reaches the glacier. Is it coming? Is it change from the Arctic? There's a cold current there. It's a change in the North Atlantic from the warm water? Is it a change in the wind? And climate records are really important. This is one fjord in Greenland. It's now the one with the longest record. The record only started in 2009. It's continuous because we deploy moorings. It's been funded by a patchwork of very supportive federal agencies and uh, philanthropic and academic institutions. And every few years, we look for funding. And um, again, these records are very important. They're expensive. And it, there's a lot of hard work from a lot of people, engineers, um, technicians, local people. I mostly work on Greenlandic boats uh, because I trust them more with uh, the knowledge of the places where we go than anybody else. So anybody who has any philanthropic connections and is interested in uh, any donation, uh, I'm here. You can come talk to me after the talk. I'm really easy to spot. OK, so what are we doing? Well, I showed you that we, we can drive more melting if we warm the ocean. We can drive more melting if we drive more surface melt. Now we need to give this to the people who model ice sheets. And, and so the one, the picture in the middle shows thickness of an ice sheet model so we can improve projections. And so we don't stop at, at the measurements, but we take these measurements to learn how things work. And then we go to the modelers and say, this is how I think the system works. How do we put it in the model? And we did this based on what we learned about how warm water gets in, about how uh, surface melt gets to the depth. And what this is what we're shooting for. This is, uh, we take a climate model, forced by some fossil fuel emission scenario that projects some warming of the ocean. We take this warming of the ocean as well as warming of the atmosphere. The models don't have the fjords, they're too tiny. Um, and so we, we have to effectively tell the model, well, here, here are the fjords, here is what's going to happen. And so what I'm showing you now is an example of one of these, um, oops, one of these models where we are projecting the changes, or we use the climate projection for the changes in temperature. And so you, can, you can see as time goes on, the fjord is getting warmer. And, and this warming is communicated to the top left, actually to all the glaciers in the fjord, and it's driving retreat. And so we're using the knowledge gained from the field work to make this connection and improve our ability to make forecast. So what, what we've learned, not just us, but other groups, um, actually has been used um, by the ice sheet modelers who have made new projections. This is a large group. They're all better dressed. Uh, they're all modelers. And um, um, we, we have improved projections. And uh, this is really one of the goals here is to try and improve, reduce uncertainties. and. Um, there's no question that ice sheets will melt in a warming planet. That's not what's under discussion. What we're trying to do is improve our understanding of how quickly they will melt so that we can uh, plan for it, as well as uh, hopefully advocate for a reduction in fossil fuel burning. Um, I'm going to. Okay, so we've talked a lot about global sea level rise, societal impacts. I've talked about global societies, but Greenland is changing and there are people living on the island. Um, and 
the margins of Greenland are incredibly productive, which for an oceanographer means there's a lot of fish and, and life in the ocean that supports many of the communities. And it's not by chance because glaciers uh, don't just discharge ice into the ocean. They're actually very effective at stirring nutrients. And so this is an incredibly biodiverse and productive region um, of the ocean. And, and so Greenland has been warming. This is a picture taken by a colleague in Northwest Greenland. Um, you actually see a, a dog sled and, and they're walking. It looks like they're walking on water. They're actually walking over sea ice, uh, but there's been so much melt from snow nearby that it's flooded over the sea ice. And so the conditions are changing. And because we, we kept going to the fjords to study the physics, how the ice ocean atmosphere, we also started incorporating the biology as well as asking um, colleagues in Greenland, what, what do we uh, need to understand? And, and so we're working a lot with um, fisheries people and, and in general biologists to study changes in the marine ecosystem. And I think this is uh, important. We don't just dissect the physics of the ice, the ocean. Uh, we really see these systems as a uh, connected environment. And so the last video I'd like to show actually doesn't have the research. It's still all collected from our being in the field. Um, and the music won't be as loud. And uh, it's meant to, to immerse you a little bit in what I've been so fortunate to experience year after year, which is being uh, in these environments. <laughs>
Um, so, so I tried to do three things, I think, today. The first one is ice sheets, you know, let you know, ice sheets are melting. They will continue to melt. We are on a warming planet. And I tried to show you how climate research works. We go to the field, uh, measure some things we didn't know before. We come back, we put them in models. We try to improve our ability to make projections in the hope that this can also inform policies and behaviors uh, to modify um, the warming that we're driving. Um, the other big point I want to make is we do this work together. We do it across nations. We do it across um, methodologies, disciplines. There's glaciologists, engineers, atmospheric scientists, uh, Greenland people without whom this work would be impossible. Uh, including their knowledge uh, as fishermen and hunters in these region. We also benefit in science from a diversity of backgrounds. As you can see, everything is very creative. We pull away icebergs and have to come up with creative ways of working in a challenging environment. Um, people really bringing diverse experience are key to this. And lastly, hopefully I've shown you how amazing this region is and, and how we really need to take care of our planet. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was so refreshing to hear a scientist talk about such a complex system in as straightforward and fun and hopeful a way as possible uh, with acknowledgement for the magnitude of, of what we're facing. So I really, I really appreciate that. And I'm sure everyone else here does as well. And I'm sure everyone has some questions. So now it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Daniel Rothman, the professor of geophysics and co-director of the Lorenz Center at MIT's Earth Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences Department. And he will serve as our moderator for the uh, question and answer portion of tonight's program. Thank you. That was an absolutely brilliant lecture. <laughs> so thank you very much, Fiamma. And um, the floor is now open for questions. Um, there's one right there. Please go ahead. So the question I'm, I'm repeating for the people who are um, remote is how does the warm water get under the cold water? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. So um, in the, there's two parts. The first is in, in the polar regions, the water is cold, and there's two things that control the density. Uh, one is temperature and one is salt. And so the warm water that's coming from the tropics is saltier, and once you cool it enough, it becomes... Uh, in, in cold regimes, it's actually denser because of its salt content than the cold water that's fresh. Um, but there is another piece to this, which is um, the way that the warm water climbs onto the continental shelves of Greenland, uh, just like the continental shelf of New England. It's through some deep channels that were scoured by glaciers that grew in the last glacial uh, period. And so it's interesting to think about the fact that when the ice sheets expanded, um, they created channels that allow the warm water to go in now and, and melt the underside of the glaciers. It's a great question. It's a question back there in the corner. The question is, are you aware of any research that's been done if, uh, about the inflow of the um, water and phytoplankton? Um, that's a, a really good question. So the freshwater, if, if 
if we're talking about some of the fresh water that's discharged surface melt up at depth, it's actually uh, supporting some of the ecosystems, including the phytoplankton. And, and the way it does that is the waters that are coming from the Atlantic are rich in nutrients. They're old, and so things have uh, fallen and, and accumulated. Um, and the glacier is able to bring these up through this upwelling, these plumes. And there's a whole ecosystem that thrives in part because of that. Um, and as things change, we expect glaciers slowly to retreat on land, uh, which will put people like me out of business because I study them when they're in the ocean and they're on land, it's a different field. But um, this won't happen for a long time. But one of the risks for ecosystem is that this a uh, whole machinery that lifts nutrients and make them, makes them available to the phytoplankton and to the biology uh, is going to be decreased. There's a question back there in the center. Professor, if uh, we got off of fossil fuels tomorrow, is there any modeling uh, to predict when those graphs will level off? If we got off of fossil fuels tomorrow, is there any modeling that would suggest when those graphs level off? First, I think that's a great idea, and we should. <laughs> um, and, and the warming uh, would decrease, um, and, and that, that part would be relatively rapid. Um, sea level rise is, is associated mainly with two things. The first one is if, if we warm the ocean, it expands. And that's one of the things that's been happening. So the ocean has absorbed about 95% of the extra heat that has come into the planet. Um, it's, it, so, so it will stay warm for, for a long time. The other thing that drives up sea level globally is uh, melting of ice and um, and the, the, the speed up of glaciers. And that the memory of that system is longer. We would continue to see some sea level rise for a while. Uh, but if we don't act, we'll see a lot more. And so it's really imperative uh, to act quickly to um, support any action uh, by voting and, and by getting engaged to uh, reduce the warming because it will get worse. There's one right there in the center. How much of this is applicable to Antarctica? How much of the physics do we play with Antarctica? Um, how much of this is applicable to what? I didn't cut. Antarctica, thank you. Yeah. Um, so actually quite a lot uh, in the sense that um, we think that one of similar changes are happening in Antarctica. Antarctica is losing ice. Um, right now, it, the, the rate, we like numbers, it's about half of what Greenland is uh, doing in terms of sea level rise and, and um, mass of ice melted. And in Antarctica, we think that the ocean is the primary driver of change because the air around Antarctica is still very cold and there's very little surface melt. So the second process that causes ice sheets to shrink, which is increasing air temperatures, driving more melting from above, is still very weak in Antarctica um, because of how the atmospheric and oceanic uh, circulations are really good at keeping Antarctica cold. But the warming waters are reaching Antarctica and melting the underside of ice shelves much larger in Antarctica. And this process of ice speed up is the major driver of ice loss uh, in Antarctica and again projected to increase. Back there in the middle. So the question is about the fluctuations in the plot at the end of temperature since 2009. 
Right. That's our record. And, and that's a very good question. Um, we don't expect to um, see these average warming curves everywhere. And what that graph is showing us is um, in, in this region of the North Atlantic, there's a lot of uh, variability um, associated with changes in winds or, or changes in, in the ocean. And so uh, if I average over a larger region of ocean further south, I would be able to see the warming. But in this short record in the fjord, we do not see a warming yet. And um, we, what we are seeing, though, is a series of um, processes driving some of these changes. And, and so this is kind of a good um, segue into why do, why do we need to keep measuring? It's, it's, it's really so we can understand what is driving some of the changes. So based on that short record, but it's a short record. And of course, we started measuring after things had already changed. So the measurement I really wanted is measurements that started in the 1990s so that I could answer the question of what happened in the early 2000s. We started in 2009. The North Atlantic has stayed in a relatively warm phase and everything's kind of pretty flat. Um, if the North Atlantic, at some point, will go into a cold phase because there's natural variability, maybe we'll capture that, or we might see continued uh, temperature increase or stable. Back there. If all the glaciers melted in Greenland, how would that affect us here in Boston? Oh, that's a tough one. And coming <laughs> from a, a budding scientist, I can see that. Um, so yeah, I, I threw out this number, 21 feet. That's a lot of water. And so um, it won't happen quickly, but um, it will cause flooding. Uh, we might want to move up the hill and, uh, or, you know, live at a uh, higher elevation in uh, any of the high rises. Um, I, I think we're already seeing increased flooding uh, for, for a number of reasons, but sea level rise is one of it. I think, um, probably don't need to tell this audience, but um, a lot of climate change will disproportionately affect the people who don't have the luxury to uh, move inland or don't have the means and so, but that's that's a very good question. Um, yeah. Right there. How did the Greenlandic communities that you were staying in during that time kind of react to what was going on with the glaciers around them? How like were they using like their own methods to combat that? And like how what did their day-to-day -day change? The question is, how does the Greenlandic community um, where you visited um, react to the changes? Um, that's a good question. So the, the Green, Greenlandic communities are highly adaptive um, and, and they depend a lot on their land still for uh, sustenance. So um, they are adapting means of travel. For example, as the sea ice melt, um, they're having to change some of the practices for hunting, fishing, um, they don't live right at the edge of glaciers, but um, in, in sort of more shielded areas. Um, many are aware that things are changing. They also see changes in uh, the ecosystems. Um, and I think like everybody, they, they're trying to figure out um, how to, to change some of the things to, to keep living um, off of their land. So uh, I'd like to shift to our remote audience now for uh, some questions. And one is, have you seen your research being used by policymakers or influence any decision making in the climate change world? I mean, let's see. Um, 
I've seen some of our pictures being used as, as testaments of, uh, or some of the colleagues of changes. Um, the graph I showed that was from the last IPCC is in um, policy documents, and it's something that we contributed to um, through the measurements, but also actively. But um, other, other than this, I think, you know, from what we measure um, to projections, there's a lot of steps in between, and, it, and it's sort of uh, this connected science. So um, that's, that's it. So, so, so the information is flowing, and, and it's being used in documents that are produced for policy. Okay, so we have time for one more question from the remote audience, and that is, uh, thank you for your important work. What are your most encouraging areas where you are finding hope and resilience in the planet? Where are the areas where it is not too late? Oh, that's hard. I mean, I think the, uh, I've been working with students and, and uh, people in Greenland for, for a long time, and including students in Greenland. And, and I think uh, the their energy, their amazement of the natural world, their understanding is our, uh, you know, one of the most positive things, their investment, the hard work that they're willing to put in to understand the climate system. And um, I think I'm going to leave it at that. I think science has this uh, amazing power of, of showing you how things uh, work and, and engaging people and and I hope that if you walk away with something tonight it's it's a bigger connection with the polar regions even though they're far away and there's one more that just came in which I think um, everyone would want to ask is what can we do to help the environment um, I think we've we've said this already um, the planet is warming I think we need to, to act and, and, and really um, it's a complex problem, there's a lot going on, but reducing fossil fuel emissions, transitioning to green energy, putting pressure on our politicians uh, to enforce policies that will achieve that internationally is, is the most important thing we can do. Okay, and with that, let's thank Fiamma once again for a superb lecture. just have a couple of notes. So thank you, Drs. Rothman and Ferrari, for your partnership on the annual John H. Carlson Lecture. And thank you, Dr. Straneo, for sharing your fascinating research. Tonight's event was also made possible with the generous support from the Lowell Institute, which allowed the aquarium to offer it free of charge. If you are with us here in person, we invite you to enjoy a coffee or tea in the lobby, which will be, remain open for another half hour. And to those of you who joined us virtually this evening, we are so glad that you did. We look forward to continuing our fall lecture series on Thursday, November 2nd, when leading white shark expert and marine biologist Dr. Greg Skomel, along with award-winning science writer Rhett Talbot, join us to share the story of the great white shark's return to the eastern seaboard. Uh, thank you all, and good night. <laughs>